there are, there are no children on today, so I think I'm okay for most of my material. Anyway, moving on. Um, remember that we will only be looking at major pests and disease and we won't get it all done today. We'll probably do another 15 minutes and take a comfort break just for five minutes. I don't know how many of you can deal with comfort in five minutes, but whatever you can do in five minutes, we'll do it. Uh, so a cup of tea and whatever else, yeah? Because we can't do two hours straight through. There's no chance of absorbing anything. I apologize for the highly reflective glasses today. I um, sat on my favorite reading glasses last night. So um, we're having to resort to some um, special ones from China. So they've probably got a disease. And this is a perfect place to discuss that. We will be talking about viruses. Please don't panic. As far as I know, they can't be transmitted via electrons. So pests and diseases, we're going to do a review just before we take a break of wood decay. This wood decay appears in three other modules in our training. And it's a very important concept to understand whether you're doing tree inspection or tree surveys, whatever else you might be doing and most certainly pest and diseases. It's understanding the concepts of wood decay uh, will lead you to be able to interpret what you're seeing into the likelihood of it killing you. And the likelihood of it killing you are extremely low. So once at the outset, so when we talk about tree risk, there really isn't one. And you'll always know when you are at risk, you can just sense it. So just remember that we um, significant amounts of decay and we are really concentrating mostly on fungi here. We do the fungus first, and then we'll probably do the actual pests and stuff in the next session. And we will be talking about um, some common stuff as we go through. Um, again, if anybody's got anything rare they want to bring along to the table for the next session, maybe not next one, because next one's Sheffield, but certainly the next time we do P and D, if you've got anything on the table you want to bring in, I know Steve's been challenging me with some dog vomit recently. Um, I'm allowed to say dog vomit, I think, Tonya, yeah? yeah. Dog yes. vomit is in fact a fungi, um, but he had a slime flux at the base of a tree and hardborn walkway. We never got to photograph it because it's fairly transient. Um, but there, if you've got anything like that that you want to help him, we'll give it a go on this session. So a significant decay may, may reduce structural strength. The spread of the decay, as you can quite clearly see, and these notes are all on the classroom. So for those of you not in classroom, um, tush, tush, but we can get on classroom, all the notes on there. I did a post on there this morning, which talks about um, decay strategies as well. So there's plenty of information on there. Uh, if anybody wants to do a quick two minutes on classroom, let me know, we can fit that in next. So the tree and fungus species characteristics, and what we mean by that, if you can remember from those who have been here a while, um, Frank, as a doctor, is probably able to identify the fact that his patient is most likely human. They might come from Gloucester, so they might not originally look like human, but yeah, generally speaking, he will have one set of biology to consider. And um, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that trees are more advanced biologically than humans, clearly they're not. But what we have to do with our diagnosis is know what the specimen is of the fungi or the disease or the parasite or whatever it might be, the virus. And we also have to know the species of the tree that it's occurring on because the interactions between the problem and the patient are actually related to the problem and the patient specifically. So some fungi on some trees have no effect on the next species of trees are quite devastating. Um, so if you went to um, you went to a vet with your hamster and you said, I don't know anything about fish, you would actually go to a different vet. Yeah, and it's the same here. You do need to know both sides of the equation in order to make a diagnosis. So those of you who didn't get six out of six in that last session with Derek, you need to start panicking. So we need to consider the tree and the fungus species characteristics as they relate individually and as they relate to each other. The ability of the tree to compartmentalize, and we know what compartmentalization is, but I know that some of you won't remember, so we'll look at it again later. The age and vigor of the tree is quite important, and I think I spelled vigor wrong, but never mind. 
and the site moisture and temperature. Those are specific conditions that occur on the site that might be beneficial to the growth of fungi or bacteria or other bits. Please note at the bottom of the screen, I've got this ISA. Uh, these slides have been donated to me. Of course, I used to teach for the ISA years back. So I've left the bottom on so as I don't um, compromise, don't get sued for copyright. So fundamentally, there are three kinds of rot. Um, white rot, brown rot, soft rot. And if you can't remember these, we're just about to go through them again. If you can, you can have your five minute break now. White rot primarily attacks the lignin in a tree first. And as you know, it's the lignin in the tree that makes the tree stand up. The lignification process of tree cells and vessels and other bits of the tree's anatomy and biology. Um, the lignification is what makes them stiff and able to support the weight of the tree. The lignification fundamentally is the bit that makes a difference between herbaceous plants and woody stems. The affected wood loses strength but maintains flexibility in white rot. Yeah, so the lignin is the bit that gives it the strength. The cellulose, which we'll look at in a moment, gives it the bendy bit. If trees wouldn't bend, that they would snap. If they bend too much, they'll just fall over. But however, this bit here, oops, sorry. Bending can stimulate response growth. Just bear that in mind for the next slides. The likelihood of failure may decrease if response growth is adequate and compensates for the loss of strength. So white rot makes the tree a little bit more bendy. If it's more bendy, it stimulates response growth. Response growth makes it less likely to fail as it strengthens by the adaption of the additional wood. Brown rot, and we recognize that what's more common, brown cubicle rot. Um, this is where the cellulose has been degraded and some fungi will degrade the cellulose and some will degrade the lignin and some will degrade both not necessarily in the same order, sometimes at the same time. So this case, it's um, less bendy and more brittle. So when we have a brown rot, we tend to get more concerned about brittle failure, what we call cinder failure. Ceramic failures are also very similar things. There are different kinds of tree failure with the loss of the bendy bits, increases the likelihood of the snap. And because it doesn't move, it doesn't tend to produce a great deal of response growth. And those people who were here last time at Christmas will remember that beautiful tea towel with response growth on it. Yeah, thank you, Tonya. Soft rot, um, we tend to not to worry about soft rot so much because it tends to be more localized. But as you can see in this particular stem, that's quite devastating. And I'll show you a soft rot picture in a moment. So it typically de degrades the cellulose first, but also may modify the lignin or degrade the lignin. Uh, and it does create localized pockets of soft rot. If these are big pockets in a strategic part of the tree, uh, it can have an impact on the likelihood of failure and it can be quite, quite serious. Some of the more aggressive fungi that cause soft rots are, are of serious concern. Generally, and they're localized and not a worry. We'll look at Inonotus in a minute, but Inonotus hispidus, which is now called pseudo Inonotus hispidus, because they've renamed all the fungi in the last 12 months, just to challenge my uh, mental faculties. Um, that causes a localized soft rot on uh, plane trees, so platanus species. Quite unusual, but more and more common with global climate change. Whereas on ash, it's a devastating problem. It causes the um, brittleization of a very brittle wood. And particularly with the onset of Calara, we obviously got a brittle wood that's made more brittle and then made more brittle steel. So we do see quite spectacular failures of ash when infected by Inonotus, which is, I'm not sure it's got a common name. We'll look at it in a moment. Well, maybe not. So we've got soft rot, brown rot, white rot. And then the most important thing probably if you're considering that safety is an issue, and we often require to consider safety as the prime issue, if there's no target, there's no need to worry about risk. So let's get that out of the way. So here we're just looking at hazard. So the location of the fault or the decay or whatever the cavity in this case is quite important. 
This is about a metre to 1.2 metres up the trunk of a large tree. Um, needless to say, that lamppost, many of you might have seen this picture before, that lamppost is no longer there. Uh, it, this, this is years and years ago. The tree cracked clean off right across at this point here. So the location of the decay is just as important. Had that decay been up here somewhere, it would be a different failure criteria. But this is a whole, potentially a whole tree failure. And there are bonus points in the chat for anybody who can name what these bits are here. As we've just mentioned it several times, and there's not much of it. Is it response growth? It's response growth, and there isn't very much of it. So this is a canker with a brown rot in the background, big cavity, hollow all the way around, tree snapped, the whole thing, awful lot of above crown you can't see, just dropped straight onto, the, onto here and across the path and gone. We photographed it and sent it into the tree officer. He didn't give a dog damn when the tree failed a few weeks later. Um, so the likelihood of the tree failing is to do with where and it not compartmentalized well, then it's, it's going to be difficult for the tree not to fail at some future point. And the future point may be tomorrow, maybe 20 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, the, what we're looking at here is extensive decay and the tree is not creating response growth in order to stabilize itself. So remember when you're looking at these things, what we're looking for with pest and diseases. So the location of the decay, and we've got these in the decay strategies, which I posted on Classroom today. Heartwood and sapwood, and we know what they are. We've done our tree anatomy, I'm sure. And root or basal rot with locations. Crown we'll deal with a bit later on. Crown tends to be um, partial crown failure or branch failure, which may not require the whole tree to be removed or drastically reduced. But root rot and basal rot, obviously are different concerns for us for whole tree failures. Hardwood rot, sapwood rot, we're going to look at the next few slides. So you might consider that the heartwood of this tree has been degraded. Don't know. Um, you might consider that the likelihood of failure has increased because of the amount of decay that has occurred. Don't, I don't know what the fungus is, it's just a few rings of a tree cut slides through. Well, and there's the sapwood that is mostly still intact. So this is the heartwood decay. The likelihood of failure is all to do with the lean of the tree, the position of the tree, the size of the crown. This is just extensive heart, heart rot, heartwood decay. Um, it may mean the tree had to come down, it may not mean the tree had to come down. There's a lot more to it than just taking a picture of the decay and making um, an uninformed decision about the tree's retention. And sapwood, so obviously on the sapwood right side, and here we have, if you can see the cursor moving, here we have the sapwood. So we've got a cambium dieback, and we've got obviously what you can see here right the way through to there is extensive decay caused by a fungal we don't know that's caused an awful lot of sapwood to um, degenerate. There's a point at this where we have to talk about sapwood and heartwood as being important for strength and stability. It has always been the contention that the sapwood wasn't that important. And um, that's obviously um, thinking has been supplanted in recent years. Yes, we do need the heartwood to have the strength to create the tree to stand up, but old trees do not normally have heartwood. Yeah, so and we, we take old trees, we're talking about trees into the ancient category hardly ever have heartwood. So the tree cannot survive into old age or even maturity in some cases with heartwood intact. So when they come along and say your 200, 300 year old oak has got decay in the center, that's exactly what it's supposed to look like. Don't get them tricking you into felling the tree. It's the sapwood that's the important part on those. Because as you can imagine, if I could do my waggle dance, I'm not sure it comes over on the screen, but as I waggle left and right, yeah, my, uh, I think they call them love rings, don't they? The ones on your hip. Yeah, my love handles, my love handles straighten out. And Ask Tonya, um, she'll tell you. Eh? <laughs> what, what was that, sorry? Eh? I said, ask Tonya, she'll tell you. I don't know, Tonya's never touched my love handles. Yeah. Well, not without gloves. 
So as we bend left and right, you know, and obviously that relates to the tension wood in the tree. Yeah, so the tension wood is actually, if you can imagine this tree was moving left to right, then there's no tension available in the sap wood and the tree is more liable to fail with degraded sap wood than degraded heartwood. So be careful about the biomechanics for part of this. I know this all sounds a bit weird, but um, watch a tree move in the wind and see which, bend, which bit moves the most. It's the bits on the outside. If the bits on the outside are degraded, they don't support the tree quite so well. Depending where the sapwood is decayed will depend on the likelihood of failure. And then sapwood rot, we've got these, um, if anybody knows what this is. It's, um, you can drop that as be a bonus point in there for the next few seconds. So often definite indicators include numerous small fruiting bodies, in this case on the underside of a cherry tree. You can tell it's a cherry tree from the lentisols. So we have this beautiful chondosturium. Um, this is silver leaf. Um, and normally we associate silver leaf with just a few, uh, with a silvering of the leaf, a few shot holes. Um, but it does have, in advanced stages, decay the sapwood. And in order for you to ensure that the sapwood gets decayed, you just do reductions on the cherry tree. So you take a look at the cherry tree, it's a bit too big. We'll cut a few branches off the end and immediately the sapwood starts to decay all the way down as you allow air into the systems and the fungi gets the upper hand. So this is silver leaf in its um, fruiting body form. Um, and again, it uh, causes in cherry, in this case, we've got likelihood of failure can increase due to rapid reduction in the, in the strength of the branch. What really happens in cherry is that the whole thing just dies back and you get these little spr sprouts dropping up. But again, if you want to increase the problem with decaying sapwood, then just prune the tree. Root rot, this is obviously one of those major um, fungi. Uh, any, we won't go into the details of these, but obviously Maripolis in this case, it comes in different forms and different shapes. Root rot, depends on whereabouts on the tree it occurs, but this one is clearly on the roots and not on the base. So testing for stability in this case uh, is quite a tricky thing. So any loss of the structural roots may obviously increase greatly the likelihood of whole tree failure. You can't see the whole tree, so it's difficult to guess. But that is what happens with whole tree failure when you get root rot in the structural roots caused by giant polypore, which is the fungus we've just looked at. And this one is a soft rot actually, but um, if anyone remembers this picture, this is, um, just be able to say, we might take a break after this so as we uh, can get back to the rest of it. This is a twin stem tree. And the reason I've got this in here, it's not my picture, it's a friend of mine's. Uh, if anybody knows where they are, this is in North Carolina, in a place called Charlotte. And this is the home Bartlett Tree Experts Laboratory. It's the size of a town. It's an incredible facility. And this tree was driven past by some of the world's leading tree risk experts every day for years and years and years. And they never spotted it because it was a compression fork between two trees that crushed the cambial growth between the two stems, which allowed a soft rot to do the job. And as you can see, there's no wood left at it all. And the tree basically forced itself apart. But there was a lesson for us here. The Americans have got an absolute obsession about white picket fences. They felt that this, for us, this is just nothing. We'll just cut it up and carry on. Probably wouldn't even bother fixing the fence. But for the Americans, this was a devastating thing because one of their picket fences got damaged. There's a highway. I'm, we're standing on the highway taking the picture here where uh, Tom's took this picture, Tom Smiley. Um, we're standing on the highway, quite a busy road. Nobody really gave that a thought. Um, but the fence, absolute obsessed by fences they are. However, this one was a basal rot caused by the compaction with a co-dominant stem uh, with an inclusion going on and obviously compression crushed, crushed the tree fibers. The tree crushed itself to death, basically. Just gonna quickly take a look at definite and potential indicators of decay. There are, when you're surveying the tree and you're looking for pests and diseases, there are definite indicators and potential indicators. 
So the definites are fruiting bodies, which we're going to look at, cavity openings, we've just seen a couple of those, and insect and animal activity. Uh, and that might be a number of things. And again, that's common sense, but we'll look at it again. Potential indicators of decaying trees, old wounds, they may or may not be decayed. Response growth and swellings. If you've got response growth, it's in response to something. Um, and a swelling on the trunk of the tree, we'll look at a picture in a minute, may or may not be an indicator. So if you see these, you probably need to do more investigations about the problem. Cracks and seams, oozing, that's obviously stuff oozing out of the bark. Dead or loose bark, cracking or flaking off, and sunken areas in the tree, particularly at the base, where the tree is simply not growing at the same rate as the rest of the tree. So you have a sunken area. And those are potential, and there are obviously others, potential indicators and definite indicators. This one we know straight away, and we can write down, it has a decay, and this is the evidence. This one says, it may have decay, we need to do more work. So that one is, um, is a factual thing and that one's um, uh, an opinion thing. So I'm hoping that we all know what these are, but here we have chicken in the woods, which is Latiporus sulfurius, which is a brown rot. And this case is popping off an oak tree where it's extensively decayed. If you don't think that is a definite indicator of decay, there's nothing I can do to help you. This one is a heartwood intact. So this is Ganoderma white rot and it causes a white rot of the heartwood, and there's no damage to the tree as such, in this case, a slight sunken area, but it is a bracket fungi. So we spot a bracket fungi in the tree. We absolutely must consider that there's some decay associated with it. This one I'd go definitely definite. That one may slip into, maybe it isn't. It might just be very early stages. Who's waving the AA book at us? Oh, Derek. Yeah, it's me, mate. Like Derek on video, you can see the... Um, Fungi on Trees book, and both of these are obviously in that book. Very useful book. It's only about 15 quid, I think. It's not a great deal of money. It's been updated quite recently, and it's a great, it's a great book on um, the common decay fungi on trees, and some less common as well. We'll look at the um, issues in a second. Definite indicator. It's a hole. There's the old wound wood, which we now call in response growth, or adaptive growth, or whatever you want to call it. So a branch was cut off, it's donutting in order to occlude the wound, but somebody's found some decay behind it and made a nest. Absolute definite indicator. Crack all the way down, loose bark popping off, potential indicator of decay. It's clearly a fault, but is there decay behind it? We don't know. You would definitely have to do some more looking at that one. We'll take a five minute break at that point if everybody's happy. Cool. Then quickly, just finishing off on our, um, how the tree deals with decay. So we've talked about the major forms of decay. Uh, we spoke about why it's important to understand what it is and where it is and what it's on and what's causing it. And then we just look at very quickly how the tree deals with these things and the, and the pathogenicity of the pathogen how bad it is and how, how aggressively it attacks the tree will affect this situation quite um, dramatically. And it will also depend on the type of tree as to whether it's a good compartmentalizer or not. But starting off with a small tree here, we have a fungus with a wound, with a bit of a fungus infection. If we can just see, it'll be a small picture, I apologize. And as the tree grows, so the dotted line is the size of the tree as it was when it was wounded. So the tree has got a big gap there and it's starting to grow over and close it. But behind is an area of discolored wood as it continues to grow. So we have the situation where this has been kind of held off, but we've got all this wood carrying on, carrying on. So we have the advanced decay, no decay at all. So the size of the original wound is the size of the affected material as it was back then, because that dotted line is the cambial line, which is the strongest line of compartmentalization. Uh, and we'll look at the next picture with the, the next bit. So that's the transverse section. So straight across the grain, this is looking at it in longitudinal section. So here's our cross section here. That was the size of the wound at the time. Oh, sorry. 
that's the fungus that's now infecting it. But there's all the good wood holding the tree up perfectly well. So how, where and when and how this affects and when we end up with a column of decay. And for those of you who can remember the session on compartmentalization, we'll know that the wall that protects the tree, the chemical barrier that connects, protects the tree is weakest moving up and down the fibers and the vessels and it's strongest moving out across the rays. So that's why these columns of decay form. So if you really want to kill a tree, just create mul multiple wounds straight up and down in the same plane. And then we get a coalescence of decay that the tree normally can't deal with. These are the walls looking in cross section again. So this is that picture we looked at. So there was the wound at the time and the stained wood was the size of the wound more or less. So we have wall four barrier zone, which is the strongest one, wall three wall two and wall one is the one that goes up and down that you can't see in this cross-sectional picture uh, and we did do this there's plenty of notes on on the classroom and there's tons on google about compartmentalization for those of you who remember the classroom sessions you used to get a handout and you used to have to put the names of the walls into the handout uh, and then steve puts that into his um, learning folder and um and I don't tell them that this is nothing to do with my copyright. Poor quality picture, I apologize. And this comes from Klaus Matic. If you really, really want to start looking at how trees stand up and fall down, then this is one of the drawings from his from a few years ago. These are not cheap things to buy. Um, but if you really can't sleep, they are a good cure. So what we've got looking at here is a, a pictorial slice of a tree. And what he's done, he's converted a lot of it into simplistic terms so we can understand how the tree stands up and falls down. So the hollow ropes translate to the cellulose. So those are ropes. And I did, I did remember a joke on the television last night. I said it was um, to do with a problem that some of us older men do get, but he said it was a bit like trying to play billiards with a rope. Yeah. So they don't have any rigidity. Yeah. So these are the bendy bits. The bricks are the lignified cells. That's the strength. We're not looking at eye bars today. Those are the H, H girders. Those are the rays that run in out of the trees that hold all these things together in a three dimensional way. These are various, otherwise the tree would just fall apart. Yeah, each annual ring, which you can see here in the picture would just separate out and the tree would fall apart like a stack of road cones turned upside down. I hope that made sense. If any questions, please just shout them out and we'll have a look at them. And the other a bit and pretty much towards the last bit of the concepts behind pests and diseases is age. And many of you on here will know what I'm talking about immediately because it does kind of uh, relate to um, human pos position in, in things. Across the bottom, we have the pictures of the trees, young going up, mature, over mature, completely senescent and almost dead. A tree's ability to resist the spread of decay and to, and to fend off any um, issues with pests depends on its health and its vigor. Um, as trees mature and become where the balance of mass and energy is kind of moving the wrong way, kids run around relentlessly. Then you give them a bit of sugar and they'll run around another six hours. Give them a bit more sugar, run around another six hours. But when you get to uh, my age, give me a little bit more sugar, it just gives me diabetes. It doesn't quite work the same way. Yeah. So there's a thing about growing old. Uh, as the tree gets older, it is less likely to be able to deal with serious issues well. They won't be able to compartmentalize. They don't have the energy reserves. A lot of energy may have been stored in the heartwood, which is now decayed. Uh, it isn't able to photosynthesize better as well as it did down here. So it can't produce energy to fight off the invasive pests, the decay pathogens, everything else. So you need to consider at what stage the tree is in its life cycle on whether it can actually deal with the issues and how inevitable the end might be. For those of you who really want to get bored, the Mannion spiral, which is what we're looking at here. And again, the picture hasn't come out very well blown up. Uh, we won't spend too long on this one because this is for a, a different lecture to be fair, but 
this is going back quite a few years now, the 1970s. I think this is first came out when I first saw it. This is updated, but we have what we call a spiral of decline, and you can quite clearly see. And this is by a scientist called Mannion, and this has been quoted many times, and goes and everybody goes back to the same spiral every time. So we have the tree and basically predisposing factors, genetic potential with age and viruses, the urban environment. As these things build up, soil compaction, huge issue, poor fertility, climatic problems, low soil salts. And as you move around, the tree moves further and further down the mortality spiral yeah, until it gets to the dead. And this was just a way of visualizing the problems and how they occur in a kind of succession, one after the other. So the tree's perfectly okay, then something comes along like a JCB and slices off a few of the roots. We have a flood or a regular flood, uh, a sewage outlet, a salt, um, road salting, any piles of predisposing factors, and they start shoving the tree further down the spiral. And then as it gets towards the end, you start getting a real influx of our malaria, which we know, wooden bark boring insects, canker fungi, nematodes, viruses. They require the tree to be in poorer health in order to have a devastating effect, much the same as, as we are. We catch a cold and then it slows us down a bit and then we get another cold and then we get the flu and then we get pleurisy and then the usual things and it's all over and they come along and they cut your leg off and then put you in a home. You catch COVID and you die. And that's pretty much what we've got to look forward to. Don't want to be too depressing. Let's move on. So the biggest killers of trees. I bet you can't guess what these are. If you've seen the slide before, which is 2019, uh, you might know what these are. Nothing to do with um, funguses. In the urban environment, this is the urban environment, remember, which is where most of us are. Um, then most of the uh, young trees are killed by mowing machinery with blood streamers, but we mean ground maintenance machinery. Moisture stress is quite simply watering. If we didn't water the tree, it simply didn't survive. Uh, and I know we get a lot of rain there, but we don't get a lot of rain at the right times. And we get a lot of bits in between where it doesn't rain and the young trees can't cope with that. And then tree stakes is another big killer. And we'll have a look at that, <coughs> excuse me. So, not, it's been so long since I've spoken for more than an hour without a break. I'm just not used to it. And then mature trees, the biggest killers are root loss. And we can probably work out what causes that in the urban environment. So we cut a few roots off to put the drain in. So we cut a few roots off to put the house in, to put the wall in, to cut the garden. We, um, we plow it up to put some gardening or some farming. Um, we kill them by pouring salt all over them, whatever we want to do. Um, and that will obviously, if the tree can't take up nutrients, it can't survive. Branch loss has the same effect. It, if the tree can't photosynthesize, so we cut all the branches off, clearly there will be an impact with producing its food source. It can't produce a food source, it can't grow roots. And then environmental change where the tree moves out of its adapted climate zone or whatever. So we'll change the environment around the tree. And that might be simply a building a house next to it and it's constantly in the shade or taking the house down so it's constantly exposed to wind that it wasn't exposed to before. <clears throat> one of the biggest streets in, well, sorry, one of the biggest trees in Wensbury was lost um, quite a few years ago now. Big plane tree, small road. It had survived quite well because it was grown against the gable end of a college building. No windows, no issues. Nobody complained about the tree. The college got permission for redevelopment and they knocked the college down and the tree blew over. It's been there for 120 years and then the gable end went and the whole side of the tree was then exposed. It didn't go all the way, it managed to move about five or ten degrees off the vertical before the tree guys got there and fetched the top off in order to stop it falling onto the library next door. Um, so that's in a short term and long term environmental changes are quite different things. And there is that, um, this is um, uh, Ray Woods ash growing in Tipton. Uh, and this was only after one year. Um, why we tie trees, we're not sure. So it's a nice big cross to say we don't put stew. It's a very fast growing species. 
We don't use it in the urban environment anymore. Uh, the, all these trees are gone because they were the wrong tree in the wrong place. Um, but we managed to get there on the first maintenance visit and take all the ties off. Um, it is a big issue around um, tree staking, whether it's any point or not. Some of this has come out of the uh, survey we're doing in Birmingham, um, the use and abuse of tree stakes. Uh, we do have a kind of a convoluted situation with young trees where there's a substantial amount of basal damage caused by grounds maintenance trees, which is the, what we're talking about in the update earlier on, where um, there seems to be now we're focusing a lot more on getting the trees to grow rather than just planting trees. Everybody here has been talking about planting trees. There are more tree planting initiatives now than I've ever seen in my life before. Everybody's throwing millions of trees in the ground all over the place. Even BrewDog, one of my favourite companies in the world. BrewDog are encouraging us to plant trees in the Scottish Glens. Really useful. Thank you very much, BrewDog. Uh, I'll drink your beer, but I won't listen to your politics. That makes no sense. So we've got the situation where we've got urban trees we're concentrating on here. Now, we're planting them in the thousands, but we're not looking after them. So we plant, replant, replant, replant. We're not getting anywhere at all. So we've tended to move the focus more towards how to look after the trees. Is there the money to grow the tree once we planted it? And the biggest killer at the moment is actually in this bracket here, with well over 30% of our trees badly damaged to the point on the highways, badly damaged to the point where they'll have to be replaced. Uh, that's a third of all trees need replanting after they've been planted the first time. Now, they haven't even made it to six years old. And this is something that's all over the country, parks as well as streets. So that bit about moving away. And the thing is that the stakes don't help because they don't, they slow the establishment of the tree. Sometimes you have to stake, you've got no choice. But we discovered that the stakes on the trees in Birmingham highway network stop the cars driving into them and that's the only use they are so we remove the tree ties but leave the stakes there you know, because we've also got i think it's 12 percent of all the trees are damaged by vehicles young trees less than six years old anyway um main division of issues and we're looking at pests and diseases and we're going to be looking at these in a random kind of um, way abiotic and biotic so abiotic is non-living and biotic is obviously the living kind. So we split our pests and diseases into two different formats. Are they, is it a living thing or is it a non-living thing? And the question I have for you is one of those, um, one of those kind of Buddhist questions. What about vandalism? Abiotic or biotic? What about mower damage? Abiotic or biotic? The mower is a non-living thing. The person behind it is probably living but we'll, we could argue about that so biotic and abiotic is not quite as straightforward as it first looks but for the sake of argument we're going to move mower damage into the into the abiotic category so abiotic disorders nice simple list all these things are pest and disease and disorder problems of trees water too much and too little obvious aeration too much not necessarily a problem but too little Absolutely, so soil compaction. Too much salt, salting, and in certain cases, irrigation or fertilization causes salinity issues in the roots. In fundamentally, uh, from a biology point of view, it causes reverse osmosis, which is our issue, which basically means the tree normally shows signs of uh, drought uh, so that we get browning leaves, but it could be any number of issues. pH, anybody want to? put the, in the chat what pH stands for. We know what it is, acid, acid and alkalinity of the soils, but what's pH stand for? Can you remember? I don't have my chat up, so I can't really know what's going on here. So You'll have to tell me, Tony, because the chat's yeah. just Well, I was going to say, nobody's put anything in, but I was going to say it was percentage of hydrogen. Yes! Star pupil. Huh? Percentage hydrogen. That's what pH stands for. So when the horticulturist start talking about pH just to bamboozle you, you can actually say, I know what that means. Percentage hydrogen within the soil matrix. Temperatures, that's common sense, I think. Too hot, too cold. And we'll look at a few of those. Sunburn and scald, common sense. Too much light, too little light. 
and wind. Obviously, too much wind. Um, we know what that does, especially around Christmas. Gas is surprisingly enough quite a big killer of urban trees. Uh, leaking gas pipes are surprisingly common. They don't actually poison the tree per se, generally. So natural gas doesn't poison the tree, just displaces the oxygen and the tree can't, can't obviously transpire, respire without the O2 in the soil, without the O in the soil, sorry. Air pollution, uh, it is a killer of trees and when it's so severe that it kills trees, it's probably an awful lot worse for us than it is for the tree. Uh, air pollution and one of those worsening things. And if we were to concentrate on one world problem, that would be my first choice. So the issues around air pollution in the urban environment have, uh, are, are just scandalous. And I'm not going to rant again about the number of children that are poorly. Lightning, and I think I spelled it right. Don't know. Um, not abiotic, absolutely. So lightning strikes, and again, we're in one of the countries where lightning strikes are some of the most common in all of the world, weirdly enough. Hail, yeah, we don't get much of that anymore, but when we do, we had some over Christmas, can be quite damaging, but obviously in the spring, late hailstorms could be quite devastating to young leaves. Girdling roots and girdling in general, uh, obviously that's when the, well, I've got a picture of a girdling root in a minute, so I'll show you those when we come to it. Mechanical damage, again, fairly obvious. That's the mowers, the diggers, um, vandalism, whatever else. Grafting compatibility, might be, I don't know. We'll have a look at the grafting compatibility. And herbicide, phytotoxicity. So we're spraying the grass around the base of the tree and we also spray the tree at the same time because we didn't know what we were doing and uh, phytotoxicity. So lime trees, for instance, are particularly susceptible to round up glyphosate based herbicides. Um, and obviously lime trees have huge sucker growth at the base. So the maintenance crew has come to spray the base of the trees, spray all the sucker growth, the feathers and the suckers, the, um, and obviously the tree takes it up. It tends not to be one, one application, not an issue, but it is, um, it is a build up problem and sadly Roundup glyphosate builds up in lime trees and does cause some long-term problems. Mac, can I just um, give you something from the chat, please? No, so, yeah. um, Jenny's saying, is fire an abiotic disorder? Because of course we've seen the huge devastating fires in Australia and California. Absolutely. Um, I mean, unless, unless somebody's on here that thinks fire is alive, and it's often described as alive, I know that, but it's not. The person that set the fire was, but the fire did the damage. The fire is abiotic. And the, of course, the wildfires we're seeing in California and Australia and elsewhere are, um, are clearly of an issue around climate change as well. So was, is that, that helped? I don't know. Yeah, it might be worth adding to your list. because It's true. That's a good point. Than hail. I'll make a note. Yeah, hang on. I'll write that down as we go. These things modify themselves every time I do them. So, so examples. Do we know what that one is? Grafting compatibility. Surprisingly common. We mostly see it on beach. Beach. A lot of beach trees have grafting compatibility. about one meter up. You'll often see a weird ring around a beech tree, and particularly copper beech trees, obviously, because they're grafted. Uh, and grafting compatibility may or may not be an issue, um, but you do need to recognise it for what it is. So this is the clear trunk of a tree, and this, it's a maple, so I can't even what this was now. Uh, and then we have the top has been grafted onto it, and it's got different growth rates. Eventually, this may become quite an issue. Uh, these are um, taxodium, if you didn't know what they were. Bad picture, so it's got very pale. In a flood. Yeah, well, we don't worry, worry about trees that are adapted to flooding being in a flood. But trees that aren't adapted to flooding being flooded will have an exam uh, obviously have a very negative effect on their potential to survive, particularly if it's um, seawater. So obviously the salinity from seawater can be quite a big killer of trees. Um, so if you live on the coast, uh, not, um, I, don't, I don't think Birmingham qualifies, um, but if you'd lived on the coast, you might have a seawater floods. Um, frost damage and, and extreme cold. And again, we don't really see a lot of that anymore. We used to, 
Birch trees are weirdly quite susceptible to this, even though they grow in very cold areas. So these are just examples. And this is your girdling root. This is an extreme example. And there's an awful lot going on here because there's an awful lot of damage to the trunk here. But this is one of those trees that should never have been planted out, that was planted out. It had been left in the container too long and the roots have grown around the tree. This will never make it to maturity. It's a surprisingly common thing from the less, um, less reputable nurseries. You must take the container off the tree and take a look at whether the roots are going around the container. Because this is what will happen later on down the line. And the tree will either die or fall over. And then we all know what that is. These are the old style things we used to have. We used to have wires that we wrap around the tree with a bit of hose pipe uh, to tie the tree. We tend not to use these anymore, but the, uh, the new ties are not much better. We have some Hessian ties that we were using in tree week. We did some tree planting in tree week and we used biodegradable Hessian ties on untreated short stakes. So if, if Andy Allison forgets to go back, because I'm not going back, um, if Andy Allison forgets to go back, it doesn't make any difference because they will decay away within a year anyway. Um, so there is a simple solution. If you have to stake and tie a tree, please by all means use biodegradable materials just in case you forget to go back. No wires. Hessian sack is absolutely fine for ties uh, and then untreated stakes if you can get them. Biotic disorders. We've got 15 minutes, so we'll just be moving through. So it will be a two session, uh, a two session job again. This is normally two four hour sessions, isn't it? So um, don't complain. I was going to check how many people had gone home, gone home, but I'm not going to do that. It'll depress me. Biotic disorders, fungi, which we have looked at it a little bit. Bacteria, which um, again we um, we will look at some. There are lots of bacterial issues for trees. There aren't many virus issues for trees. Clearly, we're not going to go anywhere near human issues for trees. But we might do a few slides on the size of a virus. Viroids are even smaller. Um, for those of you who have ever done any study of tree viruses, they're pretty much the same size range as human viruses. Uh, and when you get your nice cheap mask from Poundland, we'll talk about how effective that might be against stopping a virus which is a thousand times smaller than a bacteria. Yeah. And that's the biggest size that is. Yeah. And then insects and pests. Yeah. We will talk about whether a virus is alive or not in a moment. And again, those Buddhists amongst us here can go away and discuss the concepts of life. Insects and pests above ground and below ground. And these are the main categories of biotic disorders. Common fungal diseases, and each of these we will be looking at. If anybody's got a specific one that they want to look at, throw it at us before the next session, and I'll try and include it into the talk, because we won't get in detail to many of these. Honey fungus, we know, it's one of our favourites. Um, it tends to be more of an issue as fatality of a tree. There are different strains of honey fungus. Uh, but Armillaria melia, which is the one we're talking about here today, um, has different strains within the armor of Emelia, and some are quite aggressive. Some trees are highly uh, susceptible to them, some are resistant. Uh, but often it's to do with that Mannion spiral, how far down the tree, down the spiral, the tree has gone. Um, it's honey fungus is normally the one that finishes it off. So at the bottom of the list, we have Calara, which, as you know, is ash dieback. And we call it Calara, even though it's not really you now, it's, it's, no, it's Hymenocyphus is the new name for it, but it's a bit more harder to say, so we'll stick to Calara. It's almost unknown of for an ash tree to die of ash dieback. It dies from honey fungus. And um, a, a very famous professor of these things called Lynn Body. If you, if you want to read any work about um, tree pathogens, read work by Lynn Body. Absolutely cutting edge stuff. But she just got a book out I'm surprised Derek isn't waving it at us, but he will do because I don't think it's even printed yet. But it'll soon be out. She it isn't described... finished printing yet. The price of it stopped me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are not a cheap thing, are they? Yeah, they were doing a deal. I think you could buy two books for 150 quid or something. Oh, mm, not this close to Christmas. We're not now. Um. So she described um the ash dieback Calara as Armillaria Armageddon. 
because what happens is uh, the trees get uh, get knackered up quite badly by cholera, but it's the honey fungus that kills it. And again, it's this understanding of how these diseases work in, in tandem with each other. So along comes the um, cholera virus, yeah? Cholera fungus, sorry. Um, and infects the trees, enters through the um, stomatal openings in the leaves, mostly. Um, the trees, it's fair to say that 99% of every ash tree you look at has got it. Some show signs, some don't. And that's due to the age and the condition of the tree, the veracity of the fungi, a whole pile of issues. But we will lose 90 to 98% of all our ash trees, no question about that. And we'll lose them to honey fungus, which is kind of weird. Ostelina, which is brittle cinder fungus thingy, will common name, I can't remember. It's now called Crutchmeria. And again, I will update, update the slides one day, but it's a tough word to spell, Croach Maria. Uh, that's the one of the ones that if we talk to tree wardens, we tend to concentrate on this one. <coughs> it's least like a fungus that you're going to see and more like an absolute certainty of tree failure. Ganoderma, we've looked at some pictures. In and out, as we've looked at, these are very common things. Phytophthora is a different disease. It's um. It's not like most, it's a slime, it's more like a slime mold, Phytophthora. Phytophthora in the last five years has become a massive killer of trees, mostly in the rural environment to be said, and certainly in plantations, but associated with wet sites. And Phytophthora has gone through the roof in the last 10 years. There are more varieties of Phytophthora in there than um, you can throw a stick at. And Phytophthora is from the Greek word, which is killer of plants. Yeah, that's actually a direct word, so it's actually named rather well. And many of our um, serious um, tree diseases are in Phytophthora category. So we know what honey fungus looks like, or do we? Yeah. Please make sure that we you know the difference between honey fungus and two others, which is sulfur tuft and shaggy uh, foliota, shaggy bracket. They look very, very similar. And again, the tree surgeon will come along and he'll point to your shaggy foliota and say, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to have your tree cut down. Um, please remember that there's, you need to identify this positively. There will be a ring, an annular shank, at the top half, two thirds of the way up the stem of the fight, the positive identification for uh, honey fungus or malaria, where the cap has broken off the stem, it leaves a ring around, and that's the uh, key identification factor for our malaria. And that's the mycelial sheets underneath the bark. And that's what does the damage. The mushrooms are neither here nor there. It's the mycelial sheets, the um, bootlace fungus it's often called. And it's the bootlaces underneath the trees. The bootlaces are the um, residual rhizomorphs. That means it can persist in the soil for many, many years. However, the mycelial sheets are when it gets into the cambium and very rapidly destroys the uh, functioning parts of the tree and you see the tree go down quite quickly if that's susceptible. This is our brittle cinder uh, which is if, if anybody has seen it and I know many of you have on here because this is um we've been working together for years now some of us. Uh, it looks like a little splash of tarmac at the base of a tree. Um, this is the Ostulina or Crochmeria diosta. Uh, um, it's a decay fungi that does just about anything it wants to do. Mostly associated with the soft rot, but we would have to call this a simultaneous rotter. So it does brown rot, it does white rot, it does soft rot, it does whatever it wants to do. It does it very quickly, usually, not always, and it does it below ground, so it's very difficult to detect. Um, we had a little sample of this in a jar we used to hand around in the classes. It is quite difficult. It is just looks like a few splashes of fungi. In its anamorphic stage, I don't have a picture of it here. Um, there are white rings on it when it's fruiting. Its fruiting body just looks like a white staining. Um, and it is, um, once you see this, you really do have to take the likelihood of failure quite seriously and you must do further investigation. The truth of the matter is it's probably one of the very few where we identify this and go, we probably need to remove the tree. Yeah. Unless, of course, there's no targets and we won't, we'll leave it. Ganoderma, just about the most common um, bracket fungi that we've got on all of our trees. 
if you've got an old um, prunus, an old cherry tree, you've got, it's got Ganoderma. Whether it's got fruiting bodies or not, I don't know, but it will have Ganoderma. Um, at the War Memorial Park, we often go out and take a look at the prunus down the avenue. Every single one's got Ganoderma. The older ones have succumbed and the younger ones haven't. But cherries without Ganoderma are a rare thing indeed. It's in the Basidiomycetes classification. Any bracket fungi from Basidiomycetes is not something to be taken seriously. Ganoderma, to be fair, is not necessarily uh, an, an aggressive fungi. Because it's white rot, it's not so serious, but you can't miss the fact that it's a definite indicator. Uh, and we're moving on to the decayed stump, but we'll take a look at that one, which is the, um, the result of um, cholera, so ash dieback. This is what the, the, the most classic symptom of ash dieback. This will be our wrapping up slide on this one. Now we've got two slides on here. And again, this has come back into focus in the last few weeks because we're coming into the spring, which is when they're most likely going to see the signs of it. What I would strongly suggest is you get to know the signs of the ash dieback. Uh, I'll come to that sign in a second. So this is what the leaves look like. They look like they've been fired. They look like they're droughted. Uh, it's normally on the young leaves that have just come out, as you can see on the green shoots. And they persist on the tree for quite a long time. So they don't brown and fall off as they would do in drought or other issues. Uh, if the tree's under stress, they tend to linger onto the tree all the way through and even persist into the winter. This is the rakies of, of the leaves. So these bits here, if you can make out what I'm pointing at, which is the central stem of the ash leaf, that's one of those. It's blown up a bit and it's not difficult. This is the hymenocyphus. This is the overwintering fungi. You probably will never be able to detect this walking through the woods in the streets, they're blown away or swept up. But this is the bit that causes a little problem and they sporulate. And then in the spring, the spores make it back up into the leaves and obviously um, cause a, an infection of the same tree, reinfection or adjacent trees, because the spores blow for a very long way indeed. And we consider that some of the major infections down on the south coast blew across the um, uh, channel. So it's not an issue. Most of the infections we had in the West Midlands were caused by infected stock from the, um, the low countries. So all those nurseries selling us trees from Holland were all the reasons for the outbreaks of um, ash dieback across the most of the country outside of the south coast. Uh, and again, if I'm, I would implore you in the spring to go and have a look at your local development sites where they've been doing some landscape planting and just check out that um, we haven't got Calara, um, which we blame the Woodland Trust for, and we haven't got um, Oak Processionary Moth, which is the other big import. Um, and that has all come from low country nurseries as well. We have no biosecurity at our ports. And as a consequence, we've imported an awful lot of quite bad diseases. And that's the telltale song. Was that a, sorry, was that a question? Yeah, sorry, Max. So um, Anne's just said, if somebody's cutting down ash trees because they're infected, do the spores then kind of come off the trees as they're being transported and, and stuff? So... Our sanitation requirements here have been removed. A couple of three years ago, we had quite a lot of sanitation requirements from DEFRA to say that we what we could and what we couldn't do about moving trees and planting trees and everything else. There are no restrictions on the cutting down and the moving of timber. This is not like emerald ash borer or um, uh, Asian longhorn beetle or some of those uh, where they're in the cut wood and you transport them around the world uh, in Dunnage or packing crates or whatever else. The Asian longhorn beetle outbreak in England was associated with um, uh, pallets in a pallet factory next door, which had come from China. They were palleting up roof slates, weirdly enough, but um, and they brought the roof slates in for a building and the uh, ALB got out into the uh, adjacent trees. Um, no, there's nothing much we can do about the, um, the spores from these are, as you know, if you've ever seen a fungal spore, well, if you have, you've got better eyes than I have. But you can't see fungal spores. And there's probably, even in the winter, in the room that you're in, there's millions of them blowing around. Uh, nothing you can do, and it's, it's what it is. It's pretty it's endemic now, as far as we're concerned. It'll be what it'll be. We'll just deal with the, um, 
the consequences of that. Um, so the cutting down and the moving of them really makes little difference at all. The cutting down of them is all to do with tree risk. The advice from the government is with ash dieback, if, if it poses a risk that's unacceptable, then the tree will need to be dealt with, not necessarily removed, but made safe. However, this does cause us a bit of an issue, as we've just said, the trees decline quite quickly, and we've got some pictures to look at later on, but there are plenty out there for you to research. The, the other secondary infections come along on the weakened tree uh, and cause the trees to decline very quickly. One of the things we do now know is that ash dieback does cause ash to become very brittle and very unstable. There was a few tree failures <coughs> on the tree the tree surgeons were working on. So the rigging down of the trees for the tree surgeons has become an absolute no-no now. Any trees that are in category four ash dieback have to be worked on by a MUP. So there are effects on how much it costs to remove these as well. And um, hopefully next session, the guy from Sheffield will talk about the financial impact on Sheffield of removing ash trees. He'll talk about his budget, how much they're overspent and how much they're having to move across to the removal of ash because of the risk factors they've identified. And then the overspend and all the other effects. If they can't, if they don't overspend, then that means the reduction on all the other tree budget will be the cost. It will disappear altogether because all the money is being spent on ash. Um, did I answer your question okay, the, whatever it was? Yes, yeah? thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And this is the, the famous diamond lesion we're all told to look out for, but actually quite a rare thing. Only really common on the small branches and on young trees. But this is one of those classic. We did see on a field trip with the Coventry tree, with Coventry Warwick tree wardens, when we went to the heart of England with Tom. I think Tom was on today. I think I saw him with his nice new beard Tom's got. Um, Tom took us for a, a guided walk around um, the heart of England and we couldn't find an ash tree that hadn't got this on. Um, so it ripped straight away through the heart of England forest. So all the ash on there are finished and there's no point in pursuing it really. Um, and I think we're moving into bacteria and I think we're at the end of our time, yeah? Yes, I'm afraid so. I apologise. So we've got some bacteria and viruses and then the P and D to do. So we'll pick those up possibly on the next session or the one after. Brilliant. Thank I've you. got a couple of minutes for questions if there are any. We, most of us made it. I think there's um, still yeah, 50 people. Well done, guys. Yes. Sunny day, 50 people still on the call. I, I hope know. that was worthwhile. Um, can you remember what we did in the face to face? Any questions? Drop them in now. Um, I've been going, I've been monitoring the chat as, we, as we've been going along. Somebody said that, um, oh yeah, but yeah, no, I think we've answered them all as we've been going along. So thank you very much, Mac. Absolutely my pleasure. It's been great to see so many of you turn up. Yeah, it's, 